Yeah, I got to say, Court, you were the best on that panel last night on CNBC. Just so much smarter than the other quote unquote strategist. <laughs> um, and to see that pain capital management, Courtney Garcia, just, you know, man, I felt the pride. It was, it was great. I mean, I'm just, it was a wild night. I'm just curious when the camera was off, was there a feeling in the air that this was going to be a very decisive victory and Trump was going to win? Um, or was that not the case? Like, what was the, what was the talk when the camera was off last night? as you're at the New York, New York Stock Exchange. Yeah, hopefully I can be articulate in this because yeah, I, I got home at like 1.30 last night. I'm running on very little sleep right now. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody saw this coming, right? I mean, I think this you saw this in the media leading up to it. If you looked at the polls, this was expected to be a very close race. I think if anything, as the night started, people were starting to lean more toward a Democratic win. And I think the biggest thing is nobody thought we were going to get an answer, right? I think it was expected that it was going to take a couple of days to know who was president. But we actually had an answer and Trump won and you're seeing the markets price that in. And that's what the markets wanted to see was an answer. And we actually got that last night. Yeah, it just goes to show, you know, we always talk about why there are unexpected moves in the market. Well, there's proof last night because it's unexpected. <laughs> you know, what's expected is always priced in. Um, mm -hmm. And that's always the surprising thing that people think they can outguess. Uh, you know, what's not really knowable. Well, it's also like, I mean, the market, whatever the conventional wisdom is, what everyone believes is going to happen doesn't happen, right? I mean, I heard so many people saying, oh, this is going to be contested for weeks. It could go into December. Um, you know, people are going to be all riled up. And I actually, like, I think just the contrarian in me thought we were going to get a decisive win. I didn't know who was going to win just because everyone thought the opposite. Um, and it also kind of goes back to what we've been talking about with the markets. Every week we pound the table, don't wait till after the election to put your money to work. And clearly markets melted up uh, throughout the night. And this is why certainty is not your ally when it actually comes to investing. It's actually a detriment. And we called it. We said, don't wait till the after the election to get invested because you're missing a lot of opportunity. And you did. Well, one thing is consistent through every uh, election cycle. You know, people's hair is on fire and they're trying to, you know, game it or trying to avoid the downtrend. Um it turns out, you know, the market never really cares who's sitting in the White House, whether it's a, you know, someone from the Red Party or the Blue Party, or the Green Party. Turns out all that matters is that there's someone sitting in the White House because um, the market, you know, look, we're making all time record highs today, guys, just like we did the last election. The one I know what you're talking that. about, Bob. It's different this time. <laughs> I think what kind of was different this time, though, I would argue, is the amount of cash that's on the sidelines right now, right? I mean, I think this is happening both with individuals and with businesses. People have just been like holding their breath before the election. And so now you're seeing hopefully that's going to actually bring some confidence back in where people are willing to buy houses, make big purchases. Companies are going to put capital to work like that actually should be a boost for the economy. Just the fact that we're past this election. So hopefully that's going to be a good thing. I mean, I would argue that's actually what's been priced in right now. That's why the market's going straight up is because we knew people are procrastinating on decisions, right? Like mm -hmm. your point, whether it was buying a house, if you're an M&A uh, deal maker, you were maybe holding off on making a deal happen because you wanted to see what was going to happen, who was going to be in office, um, waiting to see what the Fed was going to do. So all these certainties are coming into play now. And as we know, markets are ahead of the news. They're ahead of what's going to actually happen. But what they're telling you now is the animal spirits are out. And to your point, Court, there's still a lot of money sitting on the sidelines, paralysis by analysis. People hadn't made decisions on their money and they're feeling that pain, no pun intended. Well, I think it's a couple of things, guys. You know, first of all, I think, you know, having the election as an excuse, you know, gives you a reason to procrastinate. You know, so who wants to think about their their budget, their financial plan and their investments? Um, and so I think that, you know, that's that was just a, a good excuse uh, that you could get away with. And not just as an investor, but, you know, M&A, you know, corporations are have been holding off on projects waiting, you know, to to see who's in, in, the, uh, in the White House. So, you know, it's kind of human nature. But the other thing is, it's just this false promise of, wow, I can get 5% in a money market fund, where if you're invested today, you get a 5% move in your small cap stocks that also pay <laughs> a 3% dividend. So, you know, it, it's like it, people get confused and I think it's wrong. And the advertising does that, the press does that. You know, you, you, gotta, you gotta really get a better understanding, I think, of where return comes from to be a good investor. Yeah, and remember that 5% return on your money market it takes an entire year to get that. Yeah, as yes. you're seeing that in a day right now in something like small caps. <laughs> I mean, just to put that in perspective, it's not like, oh, you're going to consistently get 5%. It takes an entire year to get that, yeah. plus you pay taxes. But now we have the risk of that melt-up we've been talking about because there's a lot of investors that's fear of what to do with their cash. 
Um, we're recording this before the Fed makes their decisions on monetary policy. I say that Jay Powell's the ultimate panderer, um, meaning he's probably going to cut rates again tomorrow. If you're listening to this right now, if I'm right, well, that'd be great. But I think, you know, basically, politically speaking, he's probably going to cut rates and we probably shouldn't cut rates because I think the one big risk right now is that 10 year treasury, ironically, keeps going higher. It's over 4.4% as we're recording this. And it's been going up every day since the Fed cut interest rates over a month ago. This is signaling uh, that maybe the economy might be overheating as opposed to just growing. Yeah, it's pretty unusual that we have a, um, a Federal Reserve that's adding stimulus to an economy that's booming. You know, I don't remember ever uh, where the Federal Reserve was stimulating the economy by cutting interest rates, you know, when the GDP number is going at 3%. So... Yeah, it's, you know, you just, you never know. I mean, take a look a, a year ago, you know, a lot of investors were freaking out because the stock market had, had dropped 10% over a three month period and interest rates were going up and everybody assumed that inflation was going to keep spiking. So it's, um, you know, you can't, you can't always invest tomorrow based on what's happening today, right? It's, uh, we always say history does repeat, doesn't always rhyme uh, exactly. Yeah, and I would say, if anything, we're probably going to start to get to this period where if the markets do continue to melt up, but also your yields are rising, you might have this good opportunity to start to rebalance your accounts because, you know, we're seeing this across our clients. But what's happening is you're getting more and more aggressive just because that side of your accounts is growing a lot faster. If you could take some profits and buy some bonds while interest rates are good, there's probably going to be a good opportunity for that if this continues through year end. Sadly, investors don't work that way, right? Markets go straight up. They want to put more money in the market. Last year, when markets were sideways, we wanted to take money out of the market. It's you know the old proverbial Warren Buffett quote, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. I mean, I think we're seeing that play out in a big way right now. And I think you know the big mistake you can make here is there's always these assumptions. Well, Trump's in, so there's a quote unquote Trump trade. Mm -hmm. And you know what we've learned is to expect the unexpected. I mean, the best example, we talk about this a lot, is well, energy stocks did better under Biden than Trump. Who would have thought that? And in fact, emerging markets, and Trump's considered protectionist, did better than small cap stocks here in the US when he was in office. So I think assuming you know it's going to work under a Trump presidency is a huge mistake. And I know a lot of investors are going to make that mistake. And that's a problem. I mean, I think we're all governed by our human nature. Um, I don't know, Rod, do you remember the wars we used to have in the, in the uh, driveway with uh, playing horse and playing one-on-one -on -one basketball and, and you know, one of us would get a hot hand, right? And you would think, you know, oh, I got a hot hand, everything's gonna go in. But truth, be, truth of the matter is, it's just recency bias, right? It's just, you know, we had the same percentage chance of that ball going in as, as we did on any other shot. And that's the problem right now. You gotta make sure that you don't have this recency bias towards your portfolios. Like, oh, I wanna add to that because that's going up the most. Um, you know, opportunity is to buy low, right? To buy what's out of favor to buy good valuations. You don't want everything going up at the same time. So don't let that recency bias really mess up your portfolio when you finally do get out of that money market fund. Yeah, but I think that's the problem is, you know, we know the S&P 500 has done really well here. And we know that's where a lot of money is going to get funneled. And by doing that, you're buying tech stocks, you're buying AI stocks, which obviously have just done phenomenal here. But the question is, you know, that party won't last forever. In the meantime, like a lot of unexpected things can happen. I think, you know, one of the more quote unquote obvious trades is, oh, China can't do well now because we have a Trump presidency and that's going to bring in lots of tariffs. But ironically, you know, Courtney, you and I were talking about this, that could actually have the exact opposite effect on Chinese stocks. Yeah, because the other big news with China, and this is actually why it had some big moves here just within the last couple of months, is they are putting stimulus into their economy. And there's actually been an argument made, which I think is kind of interesting, that they actually may do additional stimulus if Trump is in office because they assume they're going to have a little less demand here from the U.S. and they're going to have to make sure that their consumer is in a better shape. So you actually might see more on that front. I don't know if that'll happen, but maybe that's the case. It's kind of like the anti-anti-Trump trade where it could do well just because nobody's expecting it. Well, that's the thing. It's like this conventional wisdom will put you in a poor house, right? For the last two years, because we've had, we had interest rates going up, we had an inverted yield curve, right? How long was that inverted yield curve? Like forever? <laughs> um, so, you know, always in history, you're going to have a recession, have an inverted yield curve. Didn't happen. Right now, you have interest rates going up again. Isn't long duration assets supposed to go down when interest rates go up? But right now, this market is being led by growth stocks. So you've got growth stocks going up as yields go up. 
as gold goes up. But, you know, gold's supposed to be inflation, you know, and hedge against inflation. But two years ago when we didn't have it, you know, it was going down. So you got to really avoid this rule, the rule of thumb, conventional wisdom. The only way, you know, to succeed is to diversify the living daylights out of your portfolio. And, you know, I don't know when, I don't know why. That's why we diversify. Hey, hope you're enjoying the most recent episode of Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you want a more hands-on approach and you saved over a million dollars, Bob, Chris, and I will put together for you our total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. We go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. Whether it's an income plan for retirement, how do you take social security? How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you factor in inflation? We'll build a dynamic income plan for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been up and down with the markets, extremely volatile, or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, you can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan, tied to your goals, show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life and we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, mutual fund, brokerage product, we'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost, optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make, it's what you take. You'll get our full tax playbook. If you want this full holistic review and you saved over a million dollars, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, I got to tell you, you know, the contrarian in me was always very bullish when markets were very low. Every economist was calling for a recession and we were happy to be the most optimistic people in the room. But now the pendulum's swinging and I feel like we're in this big booming bull market, which Bob, you predicted, of course. And you're starting to see those animal spirits out. And I feel like people are starting to throw caution to the wind. And the contrarian, the contrarian in me says, that's probably a big problem. And people are probably taking way more risk than they should be. And they could feel a lot of pain later. As always, no pun intended. Well, it is that pain and suffering that uh, I went through my first 10 years in the business way back in the 70s, where... I realized that um, it's hard to keep people invested unless you have a goal in mind. So if you just invest for the concept of making money, right? Making money is not a goal. More of our more recent clients that we that are coming on board, they're in the, I want to make money mode. And you don't realize that that's not a goal, right? Making money is not a goal. Why do you need to make money? I think that's really the important question. Well, also, you know, I think it comes down to two, Bob, and this is a, one of my favorite Bobisms, is you make all your money in bear markets, not bull markets. And I think this mentality of like, I've got to get while the getting is good is so dangerous. And I'd say it's dangerous only because anecdotally, I got into the business right when the dot-com bubble burst. And I saw a lot of people wipe themselves out. Um, you know, we knew people that were set for life, that actually wanted to sell their bonds um, right close to the market peak, got all in on tech stocks at that time, and literally saw their net worth get cut in half and had to go back to work again. So it's real, and it's happened in our lifetime. And you know, 25 years ago seems like a long time ago. It's really not. And my fear is a lot of investors today are going to make that same mistake. And it's a horrific mistake to make because nothing's worse than being in your 60s and realizing you were set for retirement and now you have to consider getting a job. It's real. Yeah, and I think this is really important, like as you're nearing or in retirement, especially, right? Because I mean, if you're 20, you might have time to make up the fact that if the markets go down 50%. But what's interesting, I don't know if you guys see this, but it seems like the baby boomers are more aggressive actually <laughs> than the younger clients. And I don't know if that's because, you know, like people my age, like, we were very young and impressionable when the dot-com bubble in 2008 happened. I don't know, but it seems very reversed, which is interesting. Baby boomers are always risk on, Bob. <laughs> they have been, except for, you know, you go back to 2009 and the average asset allocation weighting towards equities was 39%. Um, now it's 
63%, almost 64%. So a, a lot of it's a function of recency bias, which we talked about earlier, and, you know, investing in what's, what's already up. It's just, it's, it's just our human nature. I mean, we look at, we make our projections based on our most recent experience. So, but it is surprising though, because, you know, you have a lot of baby boomers, you know, being a 10 million turning six, you know, baby boomers to, uh, turning 65 every day. And they are more aggressive, you know, and they, you know, I don't think they think we're ever going to die. We're ever going to, you know, need the money or whatever, but it's, it is kind of a, it's an interesting observation of what's going on right now. Um, especially with a, big booming bull market to support everybody's belief system. And there's a magical word here that I think everyone needs to, to write down. It's called rebalancing. <laughs> you know, <laughs> now more than ever, you probably need to rebalance your portfolio. And it's not fun to do because you're always doing what you don't want to do. I mean, selling stocks while they're going up or conversely, like we had last year, it was actually putting money in the market while it was doing nothing or it was slightly down. But these are the moves you have to make proactively to protect yourself and keep yourself in line. I mean, investing is more about a discipline than thinking you know what's going to happen next. Because I got news for you. <laughs> Nobody knows what's going to happen next. And an asset allocation or a discipline protects you from that. And I'm seeing right now, like those risk parameters, they're just going out the window. And it's, it's a huge problem. You know what it sounds like to me, Court? Ryan's talking about common sense versus your spidey sense, right? I used to love Spider-Man because, you know, he knew when trouble was around. He had a spidey sense. He knew when trouble was coming. Well, as an investor, you don't know when trouble's coming. So you really gotta, have to use common sense. Now, what's what's the most common sense thing to conclude right now? Well, you know, hey guys, it was four years ago. We had COVID hit. The, the Dow was at 18,000 four years ago. We're at 43,000 today, right? So you know, all we're thinking about is, wow, it went from 18,000 to 43,000. Well, how about that trip down to 18,000? Anybody remember how that felt? No, we forget. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing about human behavior. We forget how we felt just like 12 months ago. Um, and that's why invariably human nature with human nature it makes us bad investors. And that's why you have to put the guardrails in place. You know, the one thing philosophy we have at our firm when it comes to financial planning is you want to build as much certainty into your portfolio as possible. And we know markets going up year to year, that's not very certain. So when you predicate your, your portfolio on that for retirement, it's such a bad idea. And there's really two reasons for this, right? I mean, we're talking about there could be a time where the markets go down and you want to make sure you're protected from that. So that's where being diversified and having things in safety like cash and bonds is important. But also the best thing you can do when the markets are down, like in a COVID or a 2008 or 2001, is buy back into the markets. But if you're 100% in the markets, you don't have cash on hand, you just have to wait for it to recover. But if you have that portion in there, that's what we did. If you guys remember during COVID, we called every single one of our clients. We were selling bonds and buying back into the markets. So that we had this crystal ball. We just said, this is like a once in a you know decade opportunity. Let's take advantage of it. And if by having that in there, we were able to do so. That's a really good point, Court, because I'm seeing that phenomenon now. Um, I remember through the 80s and the 90s, you know, got to the point where, well, growth stocks always go up, Bob. So, you know, why do we have bonds? Let's get rid of our bonds. We'll just be 100 percent in equities. And then, you know, all the uh, equities are great, but, you know, growth stocks do better than everything else. So why don't we get rid of all our value stocks and our small cap stocks and real estate and pipelines? And, you know, I'll tell you what, the growth portfolio is doing really well, but this Cisco is really the best, it's driving <laughs> all the returns. So why don't we get rid of that and just own Cisco? Well, you know, it's really hard to average into the market when your only holding is down 50% or 90%, right? So you need those alternative asset classes to have money to take advantage. So and really comes down to having that discipline, right? You want to stick to that discipline at all times because on the upside, it's real easy. But when you have that 35, 40%, 50% decline, when when Ryan says that's where you're going to make all your wealth, that's where the bear market opportunity is. It stinks when you don't have any money to act. <laughs> so, you know, and that's why you need that discipline to act. And that's why you put some dollars around that, right? If you have a $5 million portfolio, that means it's going down to two and a half million in a bad market. And my fear is most of us don't know the risk that we have right now, because typically you have lots of different funds with different names in your portfolio. Um, and then you're thinking, hey, maybe I'll buy a little bit of uh, NVIDIA or Microsoft or Apple on top of that. But then you realize when you look at every fund that you own, they all own the same type of stocks that move in the same direction at the same time. So, you know, we always like to say you live by the sword, you die by the sword. 
And a lot of these portfolios that are being built right now that you might have right now is built that way. And man, oh man, that's not a fun way <laughs> to uh, survive retirement, watching your portfolio go straight up with the potential to go straight down again. It's like my favorite ride of great adventure, but I don't think you want that as your portfolio, uh, <laughs> you know, philosophy. You know, there's four most dangerous words, right? It's different this time. It's not different. Uh, we're, not, we're not into a new virtuous cycle where, you know, the economy only goes up and stocks only go up. So it's uh, it, it's really important to, to recognize that we're all the same pe people we were four years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. And I've been through these 50% declines. They're frightening. You don't realize that uh, bull markets make you brave. Bear markets make you hide under the covers. And you can't put an, an order in when you're under the covers. So you can't take advantage of it. And you know, that's why, you know, most people don't succeed as investors, right? Because they don't have a discipline, they don't have a strategy. And again, it's common sense, not spidey sense. It's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob. After quadrupling in the past decade to new, nearly two trillion in assets, private credit is as big as the market for banks syndicated loans. Drawing investors to private credit is yields that exceeded 11% in the past few years as rising rates swelled income from the funds floating rate notes. Yeah, it's pretty surprising um, that uh, a lot of people in our space have actually been selling these investments to their clients, right? So you know, kind of like uh, most investments, they're not bought, they're sold. But I'll tell you what, a lot of private equity, uh, private credit has been sold over the last couple of years. And Dunlap was on the other day and he said, every conference I go to, he said, all you guys from the RIA space keep asking me about private credit. Could it be in trouble? <laughs> I don't know. I smell a problem, guys. Whenever brokers are selling something in droves, rule of thumb is eventually it's going to go down. Buyer beware. If you're getting 11%, you got to question it. Uh, you're probably going to have some problems with your principal. Just saying. All right, Courtney. Over the so-called lost decade in stocks from Q2 2000 through Q2 2010, that's when the S&P 500 made no money. S&P 500 dividends still rose 41%, which is a great reminder. Income is such a crucial part to your investment portfolio. This is a good reminder, this can happen with stocks over long periods of time where they don't have a lot of return that you might expect, but the income will come in consistently. It's kind of like if you have a rental property, maybe the value doesn't go up at any point in time, but you keep getting that rent in from your in, from your renters, even if your property isn't going up in value. It's a good thing to keep in mind, especially as you're in or nearing retirement. Bob, Walmart is a colossus. It's the biggest US company by revenue and employees at $648 billion a year in revenue and 2.1 million employees, which is crazy. That's more than number two Amazon. Uh, divisive elections will come and go, but no matter who wins on the next day, some 36 million people will shop at one of Walmart's 5,205 US stores. There's another 5,400 overseas or on their websites. Wow, Walmart is a big company. <laughs> yeah, it really is. And it's Really amazing. In my lifetime, I saw Walmart come out of nowhere and replace Sears, which was the, you know, the biggest retailer in the country. You never see Sears anymore. You never see the catalog at Christmas. We used to sit down and go through all the toy section, dream big. Uh, never seemed to work out that way. But anyway, uh, Walmart is one heck of a juggernaut. And, uh, you know, if things don't work out for you here, Rye, you can always be a Walmart greeter. <laughs> hey, you know, we all have aspirations. <laughs> and uh, actually, the last Kmart just closed recently, just uh, as, an, as an aside. Um, I remember Kmart when I, was, when I was a kid. All right, Courtney, third quarter revenue for China's electric vehicle maker, BYD, was $20 billion, besting Tesla for the first time ever. Man, oh, man, those Chinese electric vehicles, it's getting kind of scary. Yeah, and this is interesting because we've, you know, we've been talking a lot about the election here. Um, but when it comes to Tesla, their biggest competitor really is in China. And so that's something where if you do start to see this competition towards China and tariffs against China, that actually could be a good thing for Tesla, because realistically, those are their biggest competitors. I think with 60% tariffs, we're never going to see an electric vehicle from China in this country. <laughs> Just a prediction. All right, guys. Well, another great episode of Pain Points of Wealth, our election episode. 
Hope you enjoyed it. If you love our podcasts, we know you love our podcasts. Give us that five-star rating on iTunes, on Spotify. You can subscribe to our channel. This is YouTube. You can like this episode. Subscribe to the channel there as well. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives us the support to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed.